ten of the max. Tenakato, 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 Katoa. Uh, my name is Peter Smith and I'm the director of the Master of Business Development. It's my pleasure today to welcome Aaron McDonald from Centrality AI. Um, Aaron is the CEO and co-founder yep. of Centrality, um, as well as holding a raft of other directorships. Um, in 2018, Aaron was awarded the EY Entrepreneur of the Year for Technology and Emerging Industries category. And the following year, he was also named one of the top 50 technology leaders in IGT's CIO's 50. Um, unlike many other new ventures uh, that seek to join existing ecosystems, and Centrality is creating its own ecosystem. As a result, Centrality has been described as a blockchain venture studio that partners with innovators in key industries to create a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer marketplace of applications I expect we'll unpack that a little bit <laughs> later on. Um, to start with, I'd like to explore your journey to, walk to centrality. Um, reading all that and re reading about you, it sounds like blockchains play a big part, or, or certainly at the start of this, this enterprise. When did you first become aware of blockchains? Yeah, well, kia ora. Thanks for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, I came across the technology in, let me see, would have been 2015 when I really kind of started looking into it. I'd known about Bitcoin maybe a year before that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a kind of nerd, so it was on my radar and um, I used to play World of Warcraft and the inventors of Ethereum came out of that space. So it was kind of like a topic that mm -hmm. was being discussed by a few people. Um, and what really got me into it was a friend of mine who um, lives up in Switzerland, um, owns a law firm there, and we were talking. Uh, he's half Tongan, and he spends um, a bit of time down here in New Zealand. Um, and he was kind of having this really robust conversation with me about this newly fangled technology that hardly anyone knew about. And I was like, you know an awful lot about this for a lawyer. Um, and he said, yeah, well, I actually came up with the legal structure for the Ethereum Foundation. Okay. Um, so um, I got to meet a whole bunch of new people through him and kind of started studying it more. And in 2016 is when really jumped into to doing something about what I had learned. So it was really that almost chance yeah. connection to someone who was already yep. deeply embedded. Yeah. Uh, and ironically, serendipity is one of those things that's, um, you know, almost a necessary ingredient for success in any venture. Um, and um, they've studied, you know, all of the facets. as a famous Harvard study about the things that make a new venture successful. And pretty much you have to get everything right all the time and also be lucky. And the also be lucky bit is the thing that kind of, I guess kind of happened here a little bit. Yeah. Um, lots of, you know, execution and and um, hard work, but but luckiness plays plays a part. But this wasn't your first venture. No, no. You'd had other ventures on the way. Yep. Yeah. Were they <laughs> technology companies as well? Yeah. So I have a technology background. Yep. Um, my I started out in engineering, literally at the bottom. So I was digging trenches. Um, and um, laying cables for telecom back in the day. And I, I was fortunate enough to kind of s step out of that role um, when uh, broadband first came to the country. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that well. I, I remember yeah, <laughs> it was that, a thing, 90, DS, DSL. 93, 94, uh, maybe 95? Yeah, a little bit later than that, yeah. Late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and... Um, and at that time, in order to set someone up with a connection, you had to program the router. So mm. you kind of go in and actually come online, program the thing. And there weren't many people who knew how to program at the time. Mm. So I kind of shifted into that vein and then took off from there um, through technology roles and then into business roles and then out into venture. Um, and so I had two startups before Centrality. Um, one of them's not going anymore. We bought it and absorbed it into to centrality and the yeah. other one is um, still trading but not doing quite what I wanted it to do. Why did you move out of those 
technology rolls them into the more yeah business nature. I guess at heart I like solving problems, mm -hmm. um, and it annoyed me as an engineer that things weren't designed well um, or built well. So I would kind of say, well, how do I fix? You know, my my job was fixing faults at one point. So I was like, well, what are the things that are causing this stuff to be faulty? Okay, well, who does makes those decisions? Oh, it's product designers or it's um, a network architects or whatever it was. And so I'd say, well, I want that job so that I can fix those problems. And then you go there and you realize that those people are working with constraints that are put onto them by the product marketing team or the finance team or whatever. So, okay, I want to go and fix those problems. And so I kind of just kept trying to fix problems. Yeah. And, and um, eventually that led to running business units and then from there to running your own business. But as an entrepreneur, that, that almost seems to be the opposite to... Um, wanting to do it well, you know, we, we often have this view of the entrepreneurs doing just the minimum to get the product out there, yeah. not necessarily doing it right enough. Oh, I've got the minimal vi vi viable product, I'll fix it in the next yeah. iter iteration. I think people misunderstand that term and they focus on minimum and not on viable. Yeah. And um, viable is actually the most important thing in that sentence because when you think about a minimum viable product, a lot of people will think about it as um, a thin slice of what's possible um, and they forget about um, all of the things that make that product experience really useful for somebody um, and what you really want to cho choose is a thin slice of that so is the service experience good is the the killer feature there for the customer is the onboarding experience good is the payment experience good you want to do the the minimum viable experience across those things as opposed to you know, the cheapest and easiest thing to get out to market. Yeah. So if you kind of think about the viable a little bit harder, um, then my journey makes a bit more sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, if we think about the centrality, just for a moment. Yeah. Um, when you think about a company that is trying to produce its own ecosystem, Yeah. Minimal doesn't seem too comfortable <laughs> with, with that. You, you kind of have to be something more than just minimal viable. Yeah. I, I, I can see. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, why you went down the path you did with uh, centrality? Yeah. I think um, coming back to that first point we discussed about serendipity. So having spent time in a business enterprise, you know, in senior roles in there, and then in corporate venture, and then out in startup land, um, i have seen another problem um, that needed fixing, and that problem was actually how do you reduce serendipity when you're starting a company? So having gone through two of those mm. things myself, it was like how can you resolve that problem because you see people executing really well on good ideas all the time and it just doesn't happen for them. Um, and in my mind, that was a problem that was only going to get worse because um, these big platforms were taking the opportunity or the oxygen away from innovation by the way that they absorb capital, absorb talent, absorb I other people's ideas into their mm. machines. And so how could you possibly compete with that in the, on a long enough scale if you were trying to build your own business? Um, and and so the point of centrality was to solve the problem of serendipity. And to do that, you have to create an ecosystem. And so that was an outcome, outcome of trying to solve that problem. And the reason for creating the ecosystem is that if you look at the, t the typical approach to venture, um, you would invest in a portfolio of companies and um, if you're average you'll spray and pray you might have a thesis but you'll put some money out there and see how it goes if you're a little bit better than average you'll kind of work with each individual company and say um, i can add some value to you and i'm going to kind of bring some expertise or some networks or some like that um, but what we thought was take it a next 
step is get those ventures to work with each other and that builds resilience amongst them and it does a whole bunch of other interesting things like um, help you prove product market fit faster you've got a two-sided business model and you've got two ventures one can supply assets on one side one can supply assets on the other side so you get you solve that problem quicker um, and, and you start to create synergies that reduce that reliance on serendipity it's interesting to hear you talk about serendipity you because um, the speaker one of our earlier speakers talked a lot about um, the need to be alert for luck and mm. take advantage of it when you see those opportunities yeah um, do you find yourself looking for those serendipitous opportunities that you can take advantage of or yeah. do you do you just try and build the, the ecosystem so you don't need to worry about it. I think you can't be a successful entrepreneur and you certainly can't be successful at venture without having that in your brain. Like my mind is consistently looking for those patterns. Mm. It's trying to find those matches. It's trying to find where that, that mesh happens. And so when, we, when we're out having conversations with people or doing research on things, it's always ticking over about where is the intersection between this and that. And what, where is, how can this opportunity lead to that opportunity? Yeah. I've read that you're quite a reader. <laughs> um, are you eclectic in your reading or, or do you just tend to focus on? Yeah, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like a classical reader in that I'd sit down with a book and like read it cover to cover. That's not me. I, um, almost all of my readings online mm -hmm. um, and um, I'll get really interested about a topic and then go super deep into that. Yeah. Yeah. and then really interested about another topic and go super deep into that. So I'm always, I spend probably 25% of my day every day reading about what's happening out there. Um, and if I can't do that during a normal day, I'll be doing it after hours. So you're inquisitive and that makes it easier to spot the patterns? Yep, yep. Okay. And, you know, um, and it's not always kind of necessarily something that's, um, directly related to what I'm doing, you know, there'd be mm. topics from, you know, bio, biotech through to quantum physics, through to mathematics, through to um, economics or whatever it happens to be that's interesting, you know, art, yep. for example, yep. right? Um, and so um, having that kind of breadth of um, knowledge about what's out there helps you make those connections, I think. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by things, so good to be fascinated and inquisitive yeah. yeah and that's the inquisitive part i see a lot in, in those. Yeah. Um, and i think that also goes against the stereotype of many entrepreneurs who are often seen as being monofocused you know yeah. I've, I've got this dream i'm just going to pursue it harder and i'm not going to worry about anything out, outside of that um, you have to have both because the thing about being a successful entrepreneur is that no one, no one's ever there to support you until you are successful, you know. And well, not no one, but the majority of the tide flows against you. Yeah. And and if you're doing something that's genuinely entrepreneurial, um, then the chances are that everyone's going to think you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Because um, if you're doing something that somebody's already done, then you're not really being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And if you're doing something that nobody's done, then no one believes it's possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I think it's true. Um, we have a question here from uh, Prakar. Um, he says, um, how do you gain mo momentum as a startup, especially in terms of finding clients and or developing your products or service? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I guess the more, the simpler answer is it depends <laughs> um, because different startups are trying to do different things, right? And depending on the market you're trying to attack, um, your approach to winning customers in that market and um, building up your customer base is going to be different, right? Um, the, 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 Developing the product or service is a pretty universal thing, which is you start with problems to solve 
and then you start to understand um, how, cus how customers view those problems and what you're trying to do. And then you build out of that. So everything has to come in product development or service development has to come back from a product market fit, which is kind of simple to say, but it's yeah. it's easy, it's harder to execute on because we naturally think our own ideas are the best ideas. Um, and one of the most successful, you know, all the successful product managers I've led or engaged with in my life are people who can really understand customers. So building a great product and service starts with understanding customers and then understanding problems and then understanding how your solution fits into to solving those problems. And critically, being able to do that objectively. Yeah. Um, so did you learn those lessons whilst you were at Genai and Telecom Ventures? Yeah, yeah. so I, le I learned a lot about product management actually from um, two people at Vodafone, three people at Vodafone, mm -hmm. uh, guy Phil Patel, um, Kirsten Shalfoon and Raj Watera, um, who were three managers who I worked with as I was coming out of engineering and sales um, into, into product. Um, so they, they taught me a lot about um, the process of product development and, um, and all the kind of, I learned all the not so sexy bits. You know, a lot of people imagine um, product managers as being more like um, the brand and comms team and it's actually more like the finance team. Your head's in the data, you're looking at, your, your spreadsheet's more of a friend than anything else. And so good product managers are kind of driven by that, you know, data and knowledge and stuff, insights that they're pulling out of, um, out of those um, information sources, mm. whether it's kind of um, data and increasing that's data produced by the internet. Um, mm. Back when I started, it was talking to customers and looking at how the P&Ls were running and look, talking to the sales teams and kind of getting in and having those conversations. So yeah, get to know your customers really well is the first start to both yeah. building great products and selling into customers. Yeah. Um, put yourself in their shoes, talk to them as often as you can, and that'll give you the insights to, um, to help you make better sales presentations or to uh, address your, you know, to address your ma um, product problem yeah. better. So you mentioned art earlier. Yeah. So what what product problem were you trying to address when you got involved with art? And you probably <laughs> need to explain your involvement to people here about um, that particular involvement with art. Yeah, no, uh, so um, just to kind of close that the problem out, is a, momentum's a really hard thing, but just to, just to focus on your customers, talk to lots of people, talk to people who would be your customers, and get get out there and doing that. If you if you really understand your customers, you you will build a better product. If you build a good product, you'll find clients, and your clients will find other clients for you. That's probably the best way to sum up that long conversation. Um, the the art thing is probably so. How did I get involved with it? Well, this is a it's bit a of a art. yeah. It's a bit of a long story. Um, so. Um, the Unstoppable Art Machine is a project um, by a, a hobby of mine, a hobby company of mine called um, the Non-Fungible Labs. And um, Non-Fungible Labs has set itself up to help creators to um, explore and experiment and build in the space of non-fungible tokens, which is a new type of technology. Um, well. A resurgent type of technology that's relatively new um, and this technology allows people to um, embed the rights um, to content and sometimes the content itself in a digital token that lives on a blockchain um, and um, it open up, opens up a whole new way to distribute content and a new way to engage an audience in content and a new way to link content to money. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's lots of um, fascinating opportunities inside of that and um, the non-fungible labs team was kind of throwing a bunch of ideas out there and the one that started to stick was this unstoppable art machine. Um, the unstoppable art machine is a project where street artists um, create a piece of street art mm -hmm. 
and as part of creating that they attach a QR code to it and then they take a high resolution digital image of the street art and um, if you come and find that QR code you can scan it and you can claim the non-fungible token that's um, associated with that physical piece of work um, and then you can do what you like with it. People have been selling them for tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. And in the States, millions. In the States, millions. Yeah. Um, but the idea behind the project was how do you get more people in the world to understand what a non-fungible token is so that we can increase the market size. Um, and, um, and a good way to do that is to get people to create a, um, to create a network effect by creating a community that is looking for these pieces of art and trying to find them and discover them together. And then you can start to introduce people to what is a token and then there's a second game inside the game which will teach people another thing about um, how blockchains work, um, which hasn't been discovered yet. So um, if you're out there and you're a, a non-fungible hunter, um, then um, then stay on stay on alert because there's some extra Easter eggs inside the content there. I'm, I'm going to, have to do some more wandering around um, K Road, and I see a lot of street art there. <laughs> <laughs> Just try and see how spot, spot any of those tokens. Yeah, and the idea is you kind of you can take a project like this and build an audience out of it, and then you can turn that. Um, audience into money by doing other things with them. Yeah. Now, M Matt Dawson is interested to know um, what was the turning point for you in terms of moving from the larger corporations, <laughs> from the you know, uh, telecom, from Genai, into the more entrepreneurial space of your own venture? Yeah. Great question. Um, I guess I always felt like I was an inventor, and if I remember going back into my early days in school and high school. I was always trying to build something or rather pulling something apart and trying to make something else out of it. Um, so it was in my, in my heart and um, at one point in my career I had a, a really great manager, another awesome woman um, called Jo Allison and I'd got to the point where I'd kind of been fairly successful mm -hmm. at what I was doing and I didn't feel like there was any more success for me to have where I was. Yeah. Um, and um, I was kind of stuck because I was like bored and not really engaged and I could almost do my job on autopilot um, and she saw this and yeah. she was she was like you need to figure out what you want to do um, so she sent me to a, co a co coach career coach and we went through a process and um, in that process um, it was pretty darn clear that I had to go and build my own thing yeah um, but that's scary you know that's a it's a big step from being a you know senior person on a Corporate, good salary yeah. and a safe environment and and being successful at it too right yeah yeah um to to a position where you might go out and try to do something but that's dangerous because yeah. you know money's not the same situation and you might not be any good at it and so there's a lot of kind of doubt and stuff that comes yeah. into it but it was just a such a compelling conversation i had with this coach that i i would have um, looked back at that um, if I'd continued doing what I was doing as you know being unfulfilled for the rest of my life you know you'd always have that what if in the back of your mind. Mm. So was it just you at that time or was it you and your family involved in that decision? Yeah I, my, I guess my, my, um, my family was involved in the decision because there's an economic conversation there right mm. um, and starting a business is um, something that you know they'd have, they'd have to commit to too um, they would have to put up with the late nights, they'd have to put up with the lack of financial stability, they'd have to put, put up with all of the crankiness when, you know, things weren't going well. So, so yeah, it's, and, and having family that's supportive in that process is really, really important. Charlotte, my wife, was amazing, you know, mm -hmm. she, um, it was her credit card we were living on sometimes and and um, and I don't think that going through this process you know without without having that family support would have been anywhere near as easy mm. is she a bit of an entrepreneur as well or is she just happy that you're the entrepreneur <laughs> she's she's um, I would say she's entrepreneurial yeah because um, she was also in a corporate environment and um, now works in startups and she's very good at kind of understanding that startup um, culture and um, she works in marketing communications mm -hmm. um, and so she's she's uh, I'd say she's more entrepreneurial than not yeah. but um, 
but maybe not um, as as much of a risk take, taker as I am. Yeah. You've talked a little bit about the people who, in some ways, changed your direction, mm. um, and they they've all come from big business. And you've talked about um, some of the lessons you've learned in big business, which you, you've taken into these new ventures. Yeah. What lessons did you learn in big business that just didn't translate into mm. being a you know, an entrepreneurial organization? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I think being in a in a corporate um, gives you a perspective of um, what not to do as an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's probably the best way to put it. Like the lessons I learned from those people were um, really useful for um, tasks. You know, like designing a product, right? Yeah. That's got some good process around that, or running a P and L, or those kinds of things. Um, so you kind of you learn some tasks about it, but you learn nothing about being an entrepreneur. Um, and so um, you know the the whole way that a corporate behaves in terms of um, structure or um, process or approach to risk or all of those things are just stuff you have to throw away. And it's interesting. I worked in corporate venture before I went out into into startup land. And they like to think of themselves as innovative and they talk about being agile and all of those other kinds of things and a startup culture and all this kind of stuff. Um, and generally, it's led by someone in the business who's never had to live off their credit, wife's credit card. Um, and, and always, those people aren't thinking about where their next meal's coming from. So they'll never be entrepreneurial. Mm. They just can't do it. It's impossible. Anyone who stands up and says they can do it has never been a real entrepreneur. Um, cor corporate is the almost the antithesis of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there were lessons that you did. Oh yeah, no, like I said, on the task things, like you know, you get especially um, you know if you look at the market in New Zealand for good product marketers and product managers, they almost all come out of banks or telcos, mm -hmm. you know, because you learn those those rigors, and then you have to. Um, throw away the culture yeah. and apply those things to the things to the space that you're in, but do it in a different way. Yeah. yeah. So you started out doing technical. You moved into product management and into business development. How do you think of yourself nowadays? Mm. Other than being you know, I'm the CEO of this firm, <laughs> I'm the director of these firms. Um, do you think of yourself as a business developer, an entrepreneur? Um, I'm just a nerd with a bit more money, probably. <laughs> 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 but no, and I mean, I guess my I see well, the role I see myself playing is um, more about um, helping other entrepreneurs to be successful than it is about myself being successful, yeah. if that makes a sense. I mean, their success is my success too. We're linked to the hip in that yeah. respect. Um, but my energy isn't focused on um, trying to make my thing successful. It's trying to make them successful. And, and that links nicely to a question from out there. Um, um, how do you gauge how much risk you should take for a startup? And by proxy, how much risk for these other companies that are, that are coming to you? Yeah, um, it depends on the stage. So um, if you're an early stage startup, um, there is some formulas out there that you can use mm -hmm. for what's an appropriate level of risk for, for the early stage. And if you're a later stage startup, there are some formulas you can use that show what sort of risk is appropriate. Um, I'd say I follow those rules probably 30% of the time. Um, in early stage companies, we what we are looking for is founders that we believe in um, and that will determine almost everything about how we invest in them mm -hmm. and so and the reason for that is that whatever you tell me you're going to build on day one it's definitely not going to be the thing that you end up being successful for yeah um because at that point, you don't have enough data to make that decision or that, to know that conclusively. If it happens to be that way, then it's probably luck. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, um, and so what you're really investing and betting on is the founder themselves, yeah. um, and founding teams um, who are able to prove to you that they can um, respond and adapt and take feedback and turn that into insight and then actions yeah. is what you're really looking for. In later stage companies, we try and find pe- companies that other people don't love um, because um, there are certain types of businesses where um, no one will invest in those companies and, they've, and the market has missed something about them. And we'll almost, we'll almost always end up um, putting more into those companies than anyone else ever would. So we take more risk. But that's because we've discovered something that they haven't. But at the end of the day, in, even in those companies, you're still investing in the people rather than the product. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at, say you're kind of in your A series onwards, there's definitely at that stage you should be able to demonstrate product market fit mm-hmm. to an extent. And different companies will will need to do that in different ways. Um, a lot, some of the companies we invest in, that's not by showing growth and user acquisition or necessarily growth and revenue. Mm-hmm. They'd be proving a different point at that point, and that's the kind of company we look for. Um, so the traditional metrics which people might judge risk and how much they put into it and how much value it at, we might not we not, might not be looking for those things. But but definitely team plays an important part at that point. It's just less important because you should have already ticked some boxes by then and shown something that's tangible. Whereas early stage companies, it's all the founder. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tian Lin is asking the question. Um, you mentioned that you have a few ventures before. How do you know when something just won't work and you need to move on to something else, or you need to just push it a little bit harder? That's that's a that's a billion dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, for the for the companies you you have decided to um, not pursue anymore, what was the precipitating event which made you think okay enough yeah um because it has to be a hard decision to say it is a hard decision especially hard if you've founded it yourself yeah. you know because you're you're caught between um maybe the data telling you that this isn't going to work and the need to believe against all odds that it will work like this is the conundrum right um, you can't escape being in that position because that's that's kind of what startup life is about. Um, and that's also life. I don't have an easy answer to that question. I think I think um, sometimes it's just intuition, you know, and not going to make it. So but that's also true in non-venture businesses. Yeah. You know, in business as, as usual, you have new product you try new markets yep. and at some stage you think okay i need to walk away from this yep. um, yeah yeah i mean there's some numbers you can use to kind of look at you know how much you've invested and what the rate of return is going to be on that and um as a as a venture business you know the the um part of the problem is what is it doing to the portfolio yeah um so um you know, some of the investment decisions you might make have nothing to do specifically with that individual company, but it's like, well, this this is dragging the portfolio down. Yep. The bigger picture is making the portfolio successful. Mm-hmm. In our case, we actually have another data point, which is really useful. Um, and because we're taking this connected venture portfolio approach, if other ventures in our portfolio aren't finding that venture useful and they're not adding value to the other other players in the ecosystem then that's a good signal that it's yeah. not the right company for us yeah and, uh, and I suppose when you're in the venture space because often resources are constrained you can't just afford to say okay we'll throw another six months of money at it another mm. year's worth of money at it it's, it's much you know, the acid is really on you yeah uh, I, 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 yeah um, I wish I had a good answer for that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, I mean... Yeah. Is it just when it gets too painful? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could have, yeah, no, it can't just be that. Like, sometimes you just believe enough. And we've had a, we've had a recent example of this with a founder that I almost gave up on 
um, a business that we thought was going to end up, you know, going nowhere and we'd lose all our money on, and then just, you know, <laughs> turned around. Yeah. You know, Google's knocking on the door, and you know, you're kind of like, well, it'd been you all along, but actually, <laughs> <laughs> actually <laughs> twenty twenty hindsight. Yeah. Now, many people might think of uh, Centrality as being a New Zealand company, mm. but, but I, I know you've got quite some involvement in Japan. How did that come about? Because it's not a, an obvious path to growth. Yeah, that was another bit of serendipity. Um, when I was spending a bit of time up in Zug and Zurich, um, I met a bunch of people who were um, in the Japanese blockchain community. And so we formed a good relationship and kind of took took things from there. And then um, we, we became kind of world famous in Japan for a bit. Um, and I would go over there and, and um, walk down the street in um, Ginza or whatever, and people ask my autograph, and I'm like, what the heck is going on here? Um, so um, so it, was, it was another bit of serendipity, really. But also at the time, um, in that market, it was a very, very important market. You know, 60% of the um, trade in Bitcoin at that time was coming out of Japan. So mm -hmm. um, you had to do well there. Um, it just so happens that it's a market that kind of loves New Zealand and it's a good distance to fly. So it was, you know, not, you know, you could do the hours and kind yep. of spend time up there. And we had that connection from, from our time up in And now you get adventures from Japan. It's a funny market, actually. Um, I mean, I, in my experience, um, there isn't a really deep venture market in Japan. Yep. Um, the, the market works quite differently over there. Not to say that there aren't companies, but you know, kind of relative to New Zealand, it's, it feels less mature. Um, and you see most of the stuff that come, comes out of there is from some way related to the big mm. you know, conglomerates, mm. um, and that's kind of the market, market structure. There are people who break through that, and some people have done some cool stuff, but it's just not a market that... Um, that I think is, you know, worth spending the time to find those things in. Plus, the way deals are done there is totally different to, you know, other places around the world. So, yeah. yeah. So thinking about these these businesses that you're, you not know, to say we haven't done business yeah. there, right? But it's just been the way to do those that business has been more on the traditional enterprise side of things than yeah. the the startupy side of things. Mm -hmm. I've read that your master plan is to eventually make centrality redundant <laughs> by investing in open source technology to develop eco, you know, to, to build your ecosystem. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do when that happens? <laughs> um, so I think probably to answer that in two parts, the, the job is to make the centrality platform, you know, um, supported by the community enough that we don't need to be involved with it or that it could exist without us. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal of any blockchain platform-based project. That's that's one of the things in our portfolio. So we've got 30-something ventures in our portfolio now. And so there'll be, even if we take that goal, there's other things yep. for me to do. Um, the things I'm working on at the moment outside of that is um, is trying to get a better bridge between traditional finance markets and this new emerging decentralized finance markets. Mm -hmm. So that'll, that's kind of a big area of focus for me is how do you reconstruct the way that finance works um, by encouraging people who are from the old guard, you know, public companies, banks, yeah. all that kind of stuff, to, to move over to using these new systems. And so my next project will be quite focused on that. Um, and um, and then I'd like to um, look at solving some problems that are outside of tech in the future, um, more aligned to sustainability challenges. So that's kind of mulling in the back of my mind, and I've got a few things on the go that I'm kind of researching around that space. So once I've done with with the tech side of things, then then I'll I think I'll be looking towards that direction. Your eclectic reading has shown you new patterns to, <laughs> yeah, to worry yeah, about. Yeah. Okay. David? Um, I have a question about um, the crypto. 
system. Uh, do you think starting from a company in New Zealand, crypto um, ecosystem helped you to reach global globalization? And also, um, since that cryptocurrency is a decentralized system, do you face, have you faced any constraints from different parties like the government and things <laughs> like that? I know this is being recorded, but... <laughs> no, no, I, no, I have no problem talking about it. Um, so to answer the first question, I think for Kiwi businesses, um, you have to kind of have the mindset of being a, a global citizen from day one. Um, it's it's very there are there are some good businesses you can build here in New Zealand just by addressing the local market, but the number of those is small, um, and it doesn't typically excite VCs. Um, so you want to be thinking global. Um, Decentralisation is even more so. You know, like um, the 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 idea is to have participants from as many places as possible and as communities as broad as possible so if you're not doing that then you're not doing a good job um, and it's the kind of thing that attracts a global audience really quickly um, you know you see discords pop up for new projects with people from dozens of different countries self-organizing into you know community leaders who help support the languages and translations and all that kind of stuff is this very very amazing space to be in because the pace of innovation is so quick um, and you know if you think of a typical fintech company which is considered kind of leading edge by most people the, the crypto fintechs are moving 10 times faster and the cash flow is building up in that space you know, the the top 10 decentralized finance pro protocols are generating more revenue than the top 10 listed fintech companies already. Um, and so um, so this kind of global is an imperative. You have to do it. And so to a certain extent, being in that environment helps you become more global if you, if you kind of get out there and get stuck into it. Um, in terms of the challenges, I mean, it's better now than it was. When I started Centrality, um, and we started getting into this blockchain space, we had to fight to set up bank accounts. Um, you know, things that most startups would take for granted were hard for us to do. And it, and it was there was a lot of education we had to do to explain to people how you could do this in a safe way. And we always took the approach of making sure that we um, gold-plated the processes that we, we use when interacting with that world because we knew we had to set, set a standard that was higher than even possibly in the, the fiat world, um, because people would naturally think there was something dodgy going on. So when you say the fiat world, you mean, I know what you mean. Real money. Real money. <laughs> <Yeah>. Real money. <laughs> um, so, 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 yeah, so we always were proactive. We went and talked to regulators early. New Zealand actually has really great regulators. Um, we talked to the tax guys, we talked to the financial markets regulators, we talked to the Reserve Bank. Um, and I think if you take that approach, um, you can you, they'll generally find that they'll want to work with you. Um, and they're learning too, you know. And um, there was a process even in the beginning when um, we were talking with the FMA about the guidance around um, how New Zealand companies could interact with digital assets and what they could and couldn't do. And they were consulting the industry in that process and we met them on a number of times and they issued some guidance and we went back to them and said, hey, maybe you've not understood this bit properly. And they were like, okay, let's fix it. So we actually have a really great environment here in New Zealand. We have modern financial markets regulation here, which, um, which a lot of countries don't have and that our regulation is technology agnostic. And so you can build... Um, you can you can kind of um, innovate without having to necessarily worry about the technology constraints as long as what you're doing with that technology fits into the regulatory frameworks. Um, so I think you know that's not something you should be shy of if you're trying to do in that space. Be proactive. There's a there's now a multi-agency um, panel set up between FMA, IRD, Reserve Bank, and Com I think Commerce Commission. Um, who you can go to and test ideas with and they'll give you feedback on, you know, what the boundaries are from their perspective. Um, I'd also encourage you to talk to a lawyer to get the boundaries from their perspective. 
Um, and then you've also got to be prepared to take some risk because if you're trying to change the world, you're not going to do it by necessarily listening to what everyone else tells you is the right thing to do. It, it sounds as if you're not just, I want a better word, discovering markets, but you're doing what some of my colleagues would call market shaping, yeah. where you're getting the, the regulators to change the way the market works to to suit you to a certain extent, or to, <laughs> to, to at least uh, allow you to pursue what you, you want to. Yeah, to give you freedom to operate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and, I, and I think, you know, if you look at all of the big innovations that ha are ha have happened in the last few years, they're all things that required um, either ignoring um, the established principles or challenging this established principles, like Uber, for example, right? Mm. That was a f very regulated market that they just went in and said, "Meh, we're going to do something different, and we'll see what happens," you know. And 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 then they spent time shaping the market, right? Yeah. Um, or if you take um, Facebook, you know, and media and publishing, there's a whole bunch of established regulatory principles, and they said, "Yeah, we just don't fit that mold. We're going to go and tr try something different." And we don't; those regulations don't apply to us. And 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 then the shape the regulations. So. Yeah. Um, so technology will always lead the regulators, always. They're never going to be the innovators. They're always going to need a push in, in, the, in the direction of, of technology and innovation. Um, but there are, there are definitely ways to do it that can bring them on that journey with you and you don't have to see them as the bad guys. In terms of shaping the market, you're also doing that, I understand, through, for a better word, education. Yeah. So you've got the um, Blockchain 101 event coming up soon. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the team's always putting on on events. I think this is part of Tech Week um, yeah. coming up. So um, and if you're interested in learning more, come along. There's a hackathon. You can kind of talk to the developers, test your ideas out. Um, there's several going on at the moment. Um, there's one down in Tairafiti. Um, there's the Tech, Tech We one up here. Um, and and people will be more than happy to give you some tips and let you experiment and teach you what you need to know. So to come along to the um, Blockchain 101, do you need to be a programmer? No. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the... It's it's designed to allow programmers to experiment and hack, but you can be part of a team at a hackathon without knowing how to program. You know, and every good startup needs people with business skills, people with product skills, people who can sell, yeah. um, and developers who can build. So there'll be a, there'll be a team you can attach yourself to. Can you build? Me? Yeah. Um. It's been a while since I've been on the tools. <laughs> Let's say that. The guys that work for us are phenomenal. Um, very, very talented. And software is one of those games that if you're not doing it every day, yeah. it moves so fast. I mean, the languages these guys are using weren't around when I started, you know, when I last had a job doing anything to do with coding or developing. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, you've got to be on top of it. I think I'll leave that bit to them. Mm -hmm. One of my favourite questions is... Look I'll tell you this, though. Um, a very important part of why I think I've been successful to date is because I have spent time on the tools and I have done all of the jobs from, you know, digging ditches up the business because when you're doing something like building a product... Um, you need to be able to call bullshit. And if someone comes to me from the technology teams and says it's going to take this long to build this and cost this much money, I know enough that I can say that's bullshit. Mm. Or maybe you should think about doing it this way. Um, and and the same thing with when you're kind of doing the other side of things, you know, building out your service experience or whatever it happens to be. Um, if you can, if you've got, an, if you've worked in those areas, and you get the opportunity through your career before you go to be an entrepreneur, to spend time, you know, horizontally in the business, even if that means not going up the chain, yeah. take that opportunity because those skills will make you a more a more successful entrepreneur because you can call bullshit. Listening to you talk, that, that eclecticism, both in what you know and what you've done. 
seems to have been so very, very important. Mm. Yeah. It's, I, th I think it's hard for uh, young people starting out in business development or product management because they often tend to be very passionate about what's right in front of them. Yeah. And they find it hard to look over there or over there or move into this part of the business. Yeah. Um, I'd really encourage it. I mean, it, all, all, all good if you can get out there and kind of start a startup when you're young. That's a good, good path to take. You're just going to have to learn all those things the hard way. Um, and, um, and maybe you can take more risk when you're younger anyway because you've got you know, kids and stuff to worry about. Um, but, um, but if you are in that environment in, the, in, a, in a business now and you get the opportunity to work around the business, take it, even if it's not something that you want on your eventual career path. Like probably one of the most valuable things you can do is spend time in the service department. Mm -hmm. You know, because you will understand customers way better there than anywhere else in the organisation. Yeah. Um, spend if you're not if you're in engineering, spend time in sales, because then you'll understand what customers really want from your products. Um, it, there's no there's no amount of um, study or experience that's any be that's better than spending time with customers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm conscious that our time is almost up. Um, on behalf of the students who are here and the students who are um, not here but watching online, um, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, I'd like to thank you for the insights you've shared with us uh, and those learnings. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just before we go, is there any last questions from our audience? Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask a question. Um, you mentioned sustainability as being something that you are interested yep. in. I was wondering, um, in the future, but how does it, is that represent in your business currently? Um, I mean, you've been with lots of companies getting uh, companies getting flat for it. Bitcoin's, you know, yep. being highlighted the energy required to yep. run a work system. But how is it affecting your company? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Do you want to repeat that question because? I'm not sure everybody sure. elsewhere would have heard it. Yep. So, so the question is, how do I approach sustainability from my own business, and in particular in a sector which has kind of got some flags around energy consumption? Um, so if I can address the, 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 the popular myths about energy consumption and blockchain, um, I think the first thing to understand is that Bitcoin does use a lot of energy. Um, it's the purpose. Right, so the reason it is secure is because it's secured by the cost of energy. Um, and so by design it consumes energy and people might look at that as a, as a bad thing. And in a certain perspective it kind of is. Um, but you need to apply some relativity to that. So what Bitcoin's trying to do is replace gold. Um, gold is eight times more energy inefficient than Bitcoin. And almost all of gold's energy is using fossil fuels and particularly diesel. If you've seen any of those gold mining shows, they just have the cost of fuel is basically the floor price of gold. And as gold gets harder and harder to find, the cost of fuel goes up and up and up. That's the that's the business model for gold. And so um, but Bitcoin's much more efficient than that, eight times more efficient. And and also, it uses a lot of renewable energy. Most of the hotspots for mining Bitcoin are in areas with high amounts of renewable energy because it's the cheapest energy source and you want to find cheap energy. There's also an argument that it promotes the introduction of new um, green energy because green energy typically fluctuates um, in terms of availability, you know, it's really rainy or it's really sunny or it's really windy. Um, and you can make a scheme viable by saying, well, at the time the grid doesn't need that energy, you can pump it into mining bitcoins. And so you can see green energy growing as a result of that. Even if you don't believe any of that, and there's lots of people that do, um, there's lot, there are lots of arbitrary frivolous things that we do that waste energy. Um, for example, gaming costs more energy than Bitcoin. Or do we really need games? You know, what is that adding to society? And so people make these arbitrary things and they focus on Bitcoin because it's an easy target, because it's easy to manage, man, measure the energy cost of it. Um, but we're, as humans, we're very good at kind of 
ignoring all the things that we do personally that contribute to bigger problems. Putting all of that aside, um, most of the blockchain projects and all of the ones that we invest in are moving to a thing called proof of stake, which um, has the you know, same kind of energy put, footprint as any other technology application. So same as using Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And so it's much 99% more energy efficient than what Bitcoin's model is. And that's the kind of technology that we're invested in. And on top of that, we invest in green tech companies. Um, so we, one of our companies in our portfolio is Carbon Click, um, which is helping businesses to make offsetting carbon easy, build it into their e-commerce flows. Um, and they've already um, planted the equivalent of, or offset the equivalent of a million trees so far. Um, on top of that, um, for every person who works in our business, we more than double offset all of their work and personal carbon footprint. And so we're really committed to making sure that our individual footprint is negative and um, projects like the Unstoppable Art Machine, for every NFT that's minted, we double um, offset that in car carbon emissions. So, yeah. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. Once again, um, thank you very much for your time and your wise words. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.